Hey, this is Pastor John. Thanks so much for tuning in to either download or stream this study. Uh, we pray that this blesses you. There are a couple of things that we would like to lay before you quickly. Uh, number one is that you would consider this message supplemental in your walk with the Lord, that in no way would it replace either your being plugged into the church at the local church level or you listening to your local church pastor who has been charged with the care for your soul. Having said that, we do pray that um, this study of God's word would, would help you see and savor the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And we would pray also that if, if this ministry blesses you, that you would prayerfully uh, consider supporting VXV. And if you do, you can do so by clicking on the link below or by going to our website at vxvchurch.com. Now, I pray that God stirs your affections for Jesus Christ as you, as you dial into now the, the proclamation of God's word. Well, good morning, everyone. Morning. It's lovely to see you all today. Uh, before I get started, uh, as the screen behind me suggests, uh, go ahead and put a bookmark in Acts chapter 2. Uh, we're going to find our anchor text there this morning. Uh, quick question, who likes pictures? Yeah, right, I do. Uh, so help me out here. If I ask you to picture a man, what is it you envision? What expression comes to mind when I say man? What if I say manly man? Does the image in your mind change? <clears throat> Are you thinking of a movie star like Sean Connery or uh -huh, John Boyne, right? Maybe a head coach like Lou Holtz. I mean, come on, right? Uh, or what about your favorite pro athlete? Uh, you know, my dad was never um, much of a sports fan as far as sports teams. So while my brother and I grew up, we never got terribly emotionally attached to any particular team or teams. Uh, however, dad did like boxing. So if there was a boxing match being televised, you could bet we'd be parked in front of the Zenith TV console, absorbing some high fidelity light waves as we watched the ensuing bout. I remember watching the likes of Marvelous Marvin Hagler, Sugar Ray Leonard, Michael Spinks, George Foreman, Smokin' Joe Frazier, but who could ever forget the greatest? That's right, Cassius Clay, uh -huh. Muhammad Ali, float like a f butterfly, sting like a bee, the fist can't hit what the eyes can't see, okay. Yeah, so uh, that was one of my favorite, that boy could dance, couldn't he? Well, I have a picture to share with you all it's a photo of a man that I deeply respect. In fact, he's one of the manliest men uh, that I know, and he happens to be one of my closest friends. Here he is, while in his prime, my buddy, Cassius Cal. <laughs> that's right. Woo-wee! Now that's a real man's man right there. Leave that up for a minute. Look at that form. Oh my goodness. Woo! All right. I, and I promise I didn't Photoshop that. That's actually him uh, there. Anyway, all right, enough of that nonsense. So uh, before I get started here, I'd like to pray. Uh, so if you'd bow your heads with me. Father, thank you for this opportunity to share with my family this morning. Uh, it's my desire to specifically challenge the men of this church body and offer encouragement to the women to draw in deeper and closer to you. Our world is in desperate need of you, and the church is in desperate need of men that follow you. I pray the Holy Spirit will guide us through this lesson now, in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right. So this morning, I intend to unearth three essential components that build the foundation for the type of men that our modern church churches need, of whom our modern church seems to be all but depleted. The foundational building blocks we'll discover in today's text, uh, we will discover in today's text, uh, these can be, of course, applied easily to women, or equally to, 
but it is the responsible for ability for a godly man to be the one leading and champion what we're about to study here in the home to which God has called him to lead. Also, I haven't picked a fight with anyone in a long time, and I, I really want to see uh, what kind of impact the men here at Verse by Verse uh, can make on this community of believers. Here's the text we'll be working from. It's Acts 2, 42 through 47, as read from the NASB. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teachings, and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone kept feeling a sense of awe, and many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. And those who had believed were together and had all things in common. And they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all as anyone might have need. Day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all of, the, all of the people. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. What I would like to draw your attention to here are three components that we find taking place in the early church. In verse 42, you've got devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching or doctrine. Uh, clearly, we're talking about the Word of God here. Uh, you have fellowship to the breaking of bread, and then you've got they were devoted to prayer. They were devoted to three things, the Word of God, fellowship, and prayer. And let's not overlook the result of the things they were, the, when these things worked together down there in verse 47. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Let's review these three components in, or, in the order I intend uh, to present them, and then we'll see what the Lord has for us uh, in this simple uh, but remarkably instructive text. So component number one, God's Word. The Holy Bible reveals who God is, His nature and character, and all three forms of His triune headship. Through the regular and consistent reading of His and hearing of his word, we can, we can and will discover uh, the beauty and excellence of our triune God and the glory that he receives in redeeming his people. Reading, studying, and knowing the word of God is where we must start. This is ground zero for seeking, knowing, and loving the Lord. <clears throat> the word is his direct re revelation to your soul uh, and mine. Uh, so we start with the word, but there will be more. Component two, we will move forward to discuss the importance of prayer, our never-ending need to communicate with our Creator and Lord, to make our requests known, and to solicit His help, acknowledge our dependence on Him, and offer Him thanksgiving and praise to glorify Him above all things. And then to co component three, uh, we will discuss the importance of having fellowship with one another, and I'm specifically now talking about men meeting with other men. Ooh, that may have just tightened up a few necks, right? Huh? But we can't expect to flourish as God's godly men if we aren't, and get this, regularly spending time in fellowship with our believing brothers. We repetitiously, excuse me, we, when repetitiously exercised, these three ingredients make up an intensely potent formula that will transform a man into an unfettering, unflinching, undaunted, and dare I say, dangerous man of God that confi can confidently proclaim like Paul in 1 Corinthians 11.1, 1, be, imitators, be imitators of me, as I also am in Christ. So gird them up, boys. It's time to dance. So with the uh, boxing. Ding, ding. Round one. Take a deep breath. Acts 2.42. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teachings. 
This is the reading and hearing of God's word. And then notice down in verse 36, they were continuing with one mind in the temple, right? Do any of you recognize this excerpt? And I'm sure Alan Hill and Dale Leansvart do. The Bible contains the mind of God, the state of man, the way of salvation, the doom of sinners, and the happiness of believers. Its doctrines are holy, its precepts are binding, its histories are true, and its decisions are immutable. Read it to be wise, believe it to be safe, and practice it to be holy. It contains light to direct you, food to support you, and comfort to cheer you. It's a traveler's map, the pilgrim's staff, the pilot's compass, the soldier's sword, and the Christian's charter. Here paradise is restored, heaven opened, and the gates of hell disclosed. Christ is its grand subject, and our good its design, and the glory of God its end. It will fill you the memory, rule the heart, and guide the feet. Read it slowly, frequently, and prayerfully. It is a mine of wealth, a paradise of glory, and a river of pleasure. It is given you in life, will be open at the judgment, and be remembered forever. It involves the highest responsibility, rewards the greatest labor, and will condemn all who trifle with its sacred contents. Anybody know what that is? Huh? That's the uh, introduction of every Bible produced by the Gideons. So if you ever want to get a copy of that, uh, talk to Al or Dale. I'm sure they can hook you up. Uh, Dane Ortland, from his book Deeper, Real Change for Real Sinners, helps us with this. He says, the Bible not only corrects us, it also oxygenates us. We need a Bible not only because we are wrong in our minds, but also because we are empty in our souls. This is why I like the metaphor of breathing, taking a big breath into your lungs, <clears throat> fills us with fresh air, gives us oxygen, calms us down, provides focus, and brings mental clarity. What inhaling does for us physically, Bible reading does for us spiritually. What a great picture. Uh, when we take in the Word of God, we are quite literally inhaling into our soul the essence of all life. Genesis 2, 7 reads, Then the Lord formed a man from the dust of the ground, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. When we expose ourselves to the holy scriptures of the Bible, God fills the lungs of our spirit with each of his transforming breaths. His word regenerates life in us. Do you know of anyone who ever said, I did a bunch of breathing on Sunday. I'm good for the rest of the week. No, right? Sadly, this is how many professing Christians think they can sustain their relationship with Christ when they only, the only exposure to scripture uh, they're gonna get is once a week on Sunday, right? Uh, so just as fundamentally crucial as air is to our physical well-being, scripture is essential to the flourishing of our spirit. Here's Paul again in his letter to the Philippians. Do all things without complaining or arguments so that you will provide yourselves to be blameless and innocent, children of God above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. Sound familiar? Among whom you will appear as lights in the world, holding firmly to what? The word of life, so that on the day of Christ, I can take pride because I did not run in vain or labor in vain. Now again, husbands, the responsibility in the home falls on you and me, right? Listen to the words of Paul here in the familiar text, Ephesians 5, 25 through 26. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her, so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of the water in the word. Brothers, this is how your love for your wife according to the Apostle Paul. This is how you should love your life according to Paul. It's up to you to assure that she is being nourished by the word of God. Practically, what does that look like? 
It can mean helping your wife with the household chores, uh, enabling her to have quiet time with the Lord. Uh, maybe you take over dealing with the kids uh, at a certain time each day so mom can uh, dive into the word and breathe in its goodness. Uh, it could mean studying his word together. Um, or it could mean talking about and marveling over the goodness and kindness of God and being thankful for the gospel. And you're doing that with your family. There's no limit to the ways you can come alongside your wife and children, men, and provide opportunities for and be intentional about the word having a part of the core of your family life. It is ultimately on you, dads. <clears throat> so that's the end of round one, and our champion looks a little stunned, maybe, hopefully. Uh, now that God has engorged our lungs with his word, we do not want to hold it in for too long, or we're just going to pass out right there in the middle of the ring, right? Ding, ding, round two. Let it out. Again, from his book, Deeper, Real Change for Real Sinners, Dane Ortland emphasizes the second step to spiritual breathing, exhaling by prayer. And praying is, exalt, is, is exhaling, breathe in, breathe out. We take in the life of God's words, uh, of the words of God, and we breathe them back into God in prayer. Ortland goes on to say, put differently, no connect, put to connect, with scripture reading is simply to acknowledge that God is a real person with whom believers have an actual moment-by-moment -moment relationship. The Bible of the God is speaking to us. Prayer is speaking to him. If we do not pray, we do not believe God is an actual person. We may say we do, but we don't really. If we do not pray, we actually think he is an impersonable force of some kind, a kind of platonic ideal, distant and removed, powerful but abstract. We don't view him as father. That's pretty powerful words there, Dane. I don't think it could be stated more simply or eloquently than this. Charles Spurgeon, one of my greatest uh, theolo uh, favorite theologians, when asked, what is more important, praying or reading? I ask, what is more important, breathing in or breathing out? So as simple as that, and it's as natural as that. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18 says, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanksgiving. This is the will of God in Christ Jesus towards you. Colossians 4.2 says, devote yourselves to prayer, keeping alert, in, <clears throat> keeping alert in it with an attitude of thanksgiving. So during last week's uh, men's study, I confessed to the men that uh, I actually like my wife. <laughs> Same reaction I got from those guys. Uh, I do treasure uh, being able to spend as much time with her as I possibly can. Uh, now, Amber and I don't need to be engaged in conversation the whole time we're together, uh, but just knowing she is where I am, and I am always aware of her presence when we are together. <laughs> I can feel her presence right there. Uh, anyway, that brings me great joy. It, it really does. And so with that said, knowing that I have a Lord and Savior that has promised to never leave me or forsake me, I am reminded that I am always in his company, and he is always in mine. And just as it is with Amber, when Amber and I are together, I know he's real and present. And although I may on frequent occasion take my focus off of him, I can <clears throat> rest assured that he is there, and he never ceases to be dialed on me. Uh, praise and glory to him for that. Philippians 4, 4 through 7 says, Rejoice in the Lord. Again, I say, rejoice. Let your gentle spirit be known to all people. The Lord is near. He's always with us. He's always with us. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and pleading, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, 
and all comprehension in this case will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Men, we need to be praying for our wives and children, for their spiritual well-being, and even more crucial to their spiritual well-being, it is imperative that we pray with our wives and with our children. It is our duty to our families as we lead our households. Shall I bust open some of Ephesians 5 this morning? Mm -hmm. Or maybe I'll leave it up to this guy. <laughs> a man who does not spend time with his family can never really be a man. All right, yeah, you don't want him showing up at your front door. Yeah, shut that down. <laughs> and listen, if you aren't married and if you don't have kids, it's just as important that you pray. Pray for and with your parents if they are still around. Pray for and with your siblings if you have them. Uh, and that will end uh, round two for us. So he was on the ropes there, but it seems our champion has gotten a second wind. We can be certain this match is going to come down to the final round. Of course it is. Ding, ding, round three. We come now to complete the match and lay down the final portion for the makings of a godly man. Uh, back to Acts 2.42. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teachings and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Years ago, an old mentor of mine used to say, show me your five closest friends, and I'll tell you what you're like. Whether you have five close friends, one close friend, or even no close friends at all, I'm saying you want to become a godly man, you hang out with godly men, flat out. Hebrews 10, 19 through 25, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promises his faith is faithful, and let us consider how to stimulate one another, okay, to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together. Hey, we gotta get together, man, we can't avoid it. If we're gonna do this right, we gotta do it. As the habit of some, be encouraged, be, but encouraging every one another, sorry, and the more as you see in the day drawing, and the more as you see the day drawing near. Um, so, I mean, it's every day is another day closer to Christ's return. Okay, it's going to come. Uh, remember that time back a few minutes ago when I remembered meeting with a group of men on, on last Wednesday, right? Remember that? Remember that? That was pretty cool, right? Well, here's the deal, and I have no shame in saying this. We're going to meet again this Wednesday from 6.30 to 8.00. And good, bad, or indifferent, we're going, to go, we're going to discuss all of what I've said so far and what I'm going to continue to say through to finish this thing up. Um, for all of the things mentioned this morning, there are hundreds of things that, of course, I didn't mention, scriptures that maybe came to your mind that I didn't include. Uh, and they're all important, and that's why we need to meet together. This is why it's a lifelong process that none of us will ever master on this side of the grave. Until that time, we're going to learn from one another. Excuse me. Spur one another on to love and good deeds, Hebrews 10, 24, and press on towards the goal to win the price for which God has called us heavenward in Christ Jesus, Philippians 3, 14. Ding, 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 ding. Today's winner, the reigning champion and overcomer of the world, our Lord, Jesus Christ. <laughs> that was pretty. Yeah, okay, I, I won't ever do that again. Uh, <laughs> back to Acts 2.42. And who, the Lord, added to their number day by day those who were being what? Saved. God is being activated here by the faithful practices of his people. Word, prayer, fellowship. As silly as I may be, we're in a serious match against the world, our own flesh, and an enemy that will pulverize anyone that would dare step into the ring without that person having Christ there to take the blows. Our ultimate enemy is on a very real, seek and destroy mission. He wants to drag every human being into his arena 
where there are no holds barred and where he has the ability to obliterate as many souls as he can. John 3, 16 through 18. And please don't get blasé about this uh, text here. I know we hear it a lot. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever, one of your parents, your spouse, your child, your sibling, the fun guy at work that's always so positive, a neighbor you adore, whoever does not believe is condemned already. That should be a sobering thought because he is not believed in the name of the only son of God. Men, if you don't think it really matters whether you engage in the fundamentals or not, or if you show up or not, then pay attention. I looked up several studies that ran statistics regarding church attendance. Of the reports I saw, none showed any significant difference from the others, meaning the results were very consistent. If a father does not go to church, even if his wife does, overall only one child in 50 will become regular worshipers as adults. If the father does go regularly, regardless of what the mother does, between two-thirds and three-quarters of the children will attend church as adults. That's a massive difference. If the father attends the church irregularly, the numbers drop a bit, showing that half to two-thirds of the kids will attend church with some regularity as adults. So just even a little effort towards the church it makes a huge effect. Uh, but if you're not convinced, there's another survey found that if a child is the first person in a household to become a Christian, there is a 3.5, 3.5% probability that everyone else in the house will follow. If the mother is the first one to become a Christian, there's about a 17% probability that the rest of the family will follow. However, when the father is the first, there is a 93% probability that everyone in that household will follow. So here's where it is, gentlemen. The probability that someone's eternity is counting on you to become a ferocious, fer, ferocious man of God. The probability is that someone is counting on you. And it's most likely someone you know and love. Christ wants you. Our world needs you. Our church needs you. I need you. This is all very real. Immerse yourselves in the love letter that your creator wrote for you and breathe in his word. Speak to him with prayerful exhalation of thanksgiving and praise for his glory. Spend time with like-minded brothers, love one another, grow with one another. The more confident you become in knowing who Christ is, the more willing you become to make Christ known to others. Start in your own home and let the Holy Spirit pull them in. This is who and what we are meant to be and do. If we pursue Christ like if we pursue Christ like he has pursued us, then there is no person, place or thing that can hinder us from being true manly men of God. Transform the man, transform the home. Transform the home, transform the church. Transform the church, transform your community. Transform your community, transform your city, transform your city, transform your county, transform your county, transform your state. Transform your state, transform the country, and transform the world. The world will never get 
or never be transformed one step past the front door of the home if you don't start with the man. It's that simple. The world, excuse me, listen to this. Uh, there's no place, okay, there is no place for sissies and there is no room for spectators. The modern church already has its fill of emasculated, weak-hearted, weak-minded, milk-toast men. Amen? It's time to gear up and gird up. Word, prayer, fellowship. Inhale, exhale, engage. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I love the men sitting here today and the men who are listening to this message remotely. And still a passion in each of us that stirs us to dig in deep into your word, to be consistent in consistent communication with you through our prayers and acknowledgement that you are ever present with us. Bind us like a band of brothers together in fellowship for one purpose, which is to glorify you, Lord, through the person and works of your son, Jesus, by the power and the Holy Spirit, we praise you and thank you. And together in one accord, we say, amen. Let's worship.